Hello and welcome to Analyzing Finance with Nick. In today's video, I'm going to do another reaction. It is going to be to Jake Tran's most recent video, 1971, the year humanity became enslaved. Uh, Jake Tran is a YouTuber who's in the finance and economic space whose content I find quite interesting. He kind of goes into some of the seedy underbellies of global capitalism and exposes a lot of interesting stories in an entertaining way. I think he does a good job with these little mini documentaries. This one kind of stuck in my mind because I do agree with him that 1971 is a critical turning point in economic history. I like to see what he has to say about it. I haven't watched the video yet, so this is going to be fresh to me. But without watching it, I think that the main thing he's going to comment on as the catalyst is the removal of the gold window happened in 1971. But with that, let's get started. The US experienced a ton of real massive growth. Workers went from making $675 a year or $19,000 in today's money to more than $56,000 in today's money by the late 60s. People enjoyed paid leave and sick days for the first time. They could pay off student loans, buy houses and cars, and enjoyed a financially stable life. Payroll Yeah, I mean, I get what he's trying to say here. I think it's not entirely sunshine lollipops in the 50s and 60s when it came to living standards technology has made a lot of products including houses and cars much better and much safer than they were in those time periods but there are certain things such as college which are which i did in my videos recently my two-part series on the rise of student loan costs and education costs that were much cheaper back then in today's dollars and there are a variety of reasons for that but I think that looking at the 60s as the halcyon for standard of living is a false premise. I would shift it out 30 years, or maybe 35 years on the curve of the late 90s as the peak of living standards for the average person in the United States, not the 60s. At least 32% in the 60s alone, fiber optic cables, LEDs, weather satellites, the heart pacemaker, the internet, DRAM for computers, lasers, were all invented in the 60s alone. We landed on the moon. The upper, middle, and lower classes were all moving up together in harmony. But then, 1971 hits, and something really weird happens. The economy kept growing. Yeah, the gold standard got removed. That's what was weird happened, but... Yeah, it's the stack. The inflation was already there. The seeds were being sown because of Lyndon Johnson's policy of guns and butter. He needed to fund the Vietnam War and the Great Society social welfare programs that he passed in the mid to late 1960s. But the gold standard kind of hamstrung the government's ability to use seniorage to pay for it. And taxes could really only go so high. And widening trade and budget deficits were concerning the rest of the world who wanted to redeem their gold claims in the Bretton Woods Agreement. Uh, but then when it pushed, and France was the first one to really seriously threaten to take its gold claims back. Because Bretton Woods, the way it worked, is that every currency was pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was pegged by gold stored in private reserves by the U.S. government. But a lot of people started to believe that the U.S. didn't have the reserves or spent them already through excess deficit spending and that was kind of the catalyst that triggered what ultimately happened in 1971. However, the seeds were sown well before 1971. It started with um, the social program spending and the advancement of the Vietnam War under President Johnson. Except there was no longer everyone getting richer together. Now it was only the rich getting richer and the middle and lower class basically flatlined to this day. Even with globalization, even with the computer revolution, the internet revolution, the biotech revolution, it somehow has not added up to quite as much of a difference as people thought. And if you were in the mid-1960s, people thought it was going to be the Jetsons. Who have yeah, I mean, I agree with Peter Thiel on this. I mean, it's 2021. Like, why are we still wearing the same fashion styles as they were in the 1990s, except for, like, maybe yoga pants? And, yeah, why don't we have flying cars yet? Uh, his argument, Thiel's argument essentially, uh, is that innovation in the physical world basically stagnated in the 60s and the 70s due to excess government regulation, whereas the digital world did not have the, pro the regulatory constraints of the physical world 
was able to continue to progress rapidly. That's why we've seen most of the technological advancements that relate to the internet and digital technology because it isn't in the physical world and it really, the risk of it physically hurting somebody is lower and it's less more difficult to understand for governments to regulate. It is allowed to grow in a much freer way. And the things that have been hamstrung by regulation have been stagnated. I think the one exception to that is biotech. We've seen a lot of progress in a variety of different uh, drugs to cure all kinds of diseases in the last 50 years. And I don't think that advancement in biotechnology should be discounted as heavily as Peter Thiel and critics of progress would say so. But I think on the rest of things, he's spot on. Vacation trips on the moon and flying cars and robots doing all your work. And it hasn't quite happened. It's been just much slower. Right. The only robot that does any work that I'm aware of is the Roomba little carpet sweeper. There isn't as much progress happening as advertised and that uh, rather than racing towards utopia or dystopia, the much bigger problem is one of relative stagnation. It, it sort of manifests economically and that for the first time we have a younger generation that's not clearly doing better than their parents. Yeah, that's true. The millennials arguably are the first generation that will be poorer than their parents. I may do a whole feature video on why that's the case, but when you have a generation that is poorer than their parents, uh, it means that something is fundamentally broken in your economy in terms of the structural alignment of how it works. It's not something that would immediately cause a recession or permanent Great Depression, but it does make the social economic fabric a lot more fragile than it would be otherwise. Family incomes are up of uh, some from the uh, late 60s, but it's not clear that's the right metric because uh, you have a lot of families where uh, both spouses are working, and that's that's very different from the world of, of the late 60s. Okay. And, uh, the inflation rate skyrocketed from around 4% at the start of 1971 to more than double at 8.8% in 1970. 4% was already quite high, which kind of confirms my point is that the gold, the, the gold window breaking was a reaction to an already unstable inflationary um, monetary system that was put into place well before the removal of the gold window. The removal of the gold window is just a signal to the financial markets saying, oh, we give up on trying to have an honest, stable currency. By the end of the 70s, it would go up to 12%. Household debt exploded exponentially after 1971. So while lower and middle class income stay stagnant, they were simultaneously getting shackled in debt. This one, I think, is more of a product due to interest rates trending lower. I mean, as you see in the chart, you did see some increase in the in household debt in the 70s, but it was pretty much in line with the price level and GDP. So it's not really anything that particularly scary between say 1970 and 1980 but what really got it going starting in like the early 80s this was when the peak of interest rates were under Paul Volcker and when interest rates has been basically on a 40-year downtrend since then and with the really only hiccup in credit was the GFC in 2008 that was a product of lower interest rates and with interest rates lower people can afford to borrow a lot more against um, their existing assets, where in this case are um, real estate and college degrees and other things. So, And I do talk about more about this in the compensation video that I did, that debt has been used as a tool, a policy tool since 2000, where it really kind of started to, the curves down even more steep as a means to compensate for a lack of GDP per capita real growth and wages, which earlier in this video mentioned was a problem with dating far back as 1971. However, um, I think this one is more caused by interest rates dropping precipitously since the early 80s more than um, just the gold standard or some other structural issue in the economy. College tuition also suspiciously started skyrocketing after 1971. So I think the reason why student loans spiked really had nothing to do with just 
outright inflation. I think the main catalyst for this I talked about in my two-part student loan series, which I will attach a link to both videos. In this video, was the combination of not no longer allowing student loans to be discharged by bankruptcy and expanding the government guarantee of student loans to middle income earners and not just low income earners. So basically the banks now had guaranteed returns lending to students with really no checks or balances. And that's when the cost started to take off because the inflation started from, from the gold window 71. But it really, these laws that I've mentioned that changed the way the student loan market or didn't really pass till 78. And that's when really things started to truly diverge from what inflation would apply for student loans and education cost. And ask yourself, how many new, real, physical, truly revolutionary technologies like LEDs or fiber optics have we really seen in the last few decades besides reusable rockets? Not it's really biotech. That's really where I think you've seen it. You've seen a lot of miracle drugs, I would say, and cures to things such as HIV and hep hepatitis and a improvement on many cancer treatments. So yeah, you've seen it there and genetic engineering, but yeah, you haven't really seen it in physical machinery more sense, particularly space travel. But again, I think that has to do with, with regulation um, more than anything. Much. Something happened. The rules of the game were changed. It was no longer a level playing field. And the best part is, is that it slipped right underneath the noses of the middle and lower class. I actually love that quote. We have gold because we cannot trust governments by Herbert Hoover. Uh, Herbert Hoover was not the greatest president in American history, but that is a one pithy quote. It's the first time I've seen that one, so good job on finding that, Jake. Before World War I hit, trade around the world was conducted on a very simple gold standard. Basically, whatever you wanted from another country, you would pay for in the required weight of gold. This yeah, the rest of this video, he kind of, well, not the rest of it, but that's this section goes into just how the gold standard worked. And I talk about the gold standard in Iceberg 2. And it really basically is that every country's currency is backed by gold. And if your country is running a trade deficit, you will lose gold. And thus your currency will fall in value and therefore become more competitive until the trade flows stabilize. And if your currency gets too weak, your country will be a lot more competitive on a wage and export basis. And so therefore gold will flow to your country and it will, gold will flow from border to border in a natural way, depending on economic competitiveness. Then the gold standard was disrupted by World War I because a lot of governments didn't have enough gold reserves or money to finance what was to be like the first global total industrial war and as a result every other country went functionally bankrupt except for the US who joined the war very late and didn't really suffer any damage on its home front so it supplied a lot of the weaponry and financial capital to the rest to the allied warring parties in Europe and all of the major European powers basically got cleaned out of their gold whether it was France the UK and of course Germany and as a result the US became the only country with real gold and they tried to back the gold standard and due to these extreme imbalances it caused a lot of economic stagnation and problems uh, if you want to learn more about this era of central banking and a lot of the crazy dynamics of all the German hyperinflation and the disruptions caused by the f aborted and failed return to go back to the gold standard or Really, just more a lot of the European countries didn't want their currencies to go down to where they should have been based on how little their gold reserves are. You should read a book called Lords of Finance. The author's name is a little difficult to pronounce, but I will put a link to Lords of Finance in the description of this channel. Of infighting and disagreements between countries that used to work together. It put a lot of powerful countries in debt. They had to spend a lot of their gold buying weapons and equipment to fight against each other. And gold reserves started being spread around the world much more thinly. By the end of World War I, the US had a serious gold deficit. 
And once the Great Depression hit, this got even worse. So in 1930, the government pretty much forced Americans to exchange all the gold they had for dollars. They increased the price of gold from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. Yeah, the gold compensation 33 was more triggered by the Great Depression and, ass and assets lost, particularly banks, losing a lot of assets due to debt defaults on speculative margin loans in the stock market or the, the bust in the Florida real estate boom of the 20s, which uh, that is a, a bubble out of sea is a book that goes into that. I, and it's a very underrated part of the Great Depression that's not really talked about. And I will probably do a video about the Florida real estate boom in the 20s because you could argue that the collateral damage from the Florida real estate boom and bust in the 20s may have been more significant than the stock market crash in terms of the catalyst for the great to start the Great Depression. And similar to 08, it was a housing and real estate driven permanent impairment of capital that tr made the bust so deep and dramatic compared to other economic recessions, which were more equity wipeout based, they, or corporate bonds, or damage of people who could survive it better than, say, individual mortgage holders and small banks, like what happened with the Florida real estate bust in the 20s and the national real estate bust in 2008. Hoping that this would discourage Americans from buying gold in the future. This also meant that a lot of foreign countries suddenly got interested in trading their gold for dollars. Since they would be getting so much more money in exchange for their gold, almost every country that had a natural gold source traded it with the US for dollars. By 1939, there was enough gold in the world to replace all the money in circulation. Then World War II hit. And suddenly, the US was dipping into its gold reserves again. And if they thought World War I took a lot of money, World War II was even worse. The two yeah, wars blow up balance sheets. That's just life and history. Most governments and defaults in history are triggered by losing a war or getting a Pyrrhic victory in a war, as in the case of the British Empire, that basically cost all of your accumulated treasures over years of prosperity to win. And After all, dollars were as good as gold. With all this extra money, the economy obviously boomed, but it wasn't sustainable. By 1955, America went to war in Vietnam, and suddenly, it needed a lot more money than it had in gold. The Vietnam War carried on for 20 years and cost $168 billion, or around $1 trillion in today's money. To fund it, the government had to print money like crazy, and near the end, this reckless creation of new dollars finally caught up with it. You see, other countries started noticing that the US was printing way more money than it could possibly have in gold. So they got worried. What if the president suddenly announced that instead of $35 for an ounce of gold, it would be now $45 or $50? It would be the perfect for the US to stay afloat, but it would mean countries like the UK and France would to get their gold back. Yeah, I explained this, and that's the section I skipped in this video too, is that Bretton Woods great, works great, and the gold standard works great as long as the government is honest, but the problem is that the government's and really people in general is they have unlimited wants but scarce resources that's just the nature of economics and when you have a society that wanted a more generous social welfare state and to maintain a hegemonic force of a military and get bogged down in the vietnam war it has to be paid for somehow taxes were not necessarily very low in the 1960s it was well before the reagan tax cuts so there's a limit on how high um, revenues can be gained from taxes and so the only way they could do it is through seniorage or the printing of money and then the other countries caught on and wanted their gold back and as Jake will mention here that France even sent a warship to go out and get their gold and that's why Nixon ultimately was forced to do what he do. I mean his hand was already kind of forced by years of loose fiscal and monetary policy uh, 1970, but 1971 is really just the, again, the waving the white flag to having an honest currency and fixed exchange rates. Some would argue that it was inevitable because of Triffin's Dilemma, which I think I've also talked about in one of my iceberg videos. Uh, Triffin's Dilemma is the idea that the economy can't grow if it's constrained by a limited money supply. And because of the amount of goods and services being produced was growing at a faster pace than the 
the supply of new gold being mined, that the economy, if it was to stay on the gold standard, would be way too deflationary and thus choke economic growth through debt defaults and or just a lack of capital being able to finance future growth. I think I might have to go into Driven's Dilemma further in another video because it is kind of a controversial idea. But that's the other counter argument for in favor of removing the gold standard. And then the one point I'd like to make too about Bretton Woods and the removal was the idea of the impossible trinity, which I talked about Iceberg 5. I'm sorry if I'm doing a lot of references, but I mean, Jake's videos often do intersect with a lot of the topics I mentioned in the Iceberg of Finance. And the impossible trinity is I think one of the neatest concepts in international monetary economics because it's the idea that you have three choices that a central bank can make, which is fixed exchange rates, free movement of capital, or independent monetary policy, which means you get to set the interest rates and level of money supply in your economy to whatever suits uh, your governments and countries need. The problem is in the real world, you can't have all three because each pulls against the other two. So you have to choose two. The Bretton Woods system is it created the fixed exchange rate through everybody being exchanged to gold and free flow of capital so people can move money without restrictions. However, the cost of that is that you had to have a limited monetary policy. It had to be in constraints with the amount of gold available to be freely exchanged and the demand for money has to be set the price at the price that is oh, based on the available gold. So the interest rate would have to be looser or tighter depending on how much money there's available in international trade. The problem was is that the government needed a looser monetary policy and more money than the system could bear. And so the impossible trinity broke Bretton Woods. So instead of the, the they got the more autonomous monetary policy, but in exchange of losing the fixed exchange rate. And you're asking maybe, are there any examples of countries where you have a fixed exchange rate and autonomous monetary policy? Yeah, that's modern day China. Um, the reason what they had to sacrifice is free movement of capital. There's heavily amounts of restrictions on moving money out of China. Like individual citizens are restricted to about 50,000 US dollars a year that they can move out of the country. And the reason why they have to have those capital controls is because that's the only way you can maintain a fixed exchange rate and have an independent monetary policy. Because if you had free flow of capital in environment, the currency market would react depending on whether the monetary policy is um, in line or out of line with interest rate parity around the world. The UK and France decided to quit while they were still ahead, and France sent a warship to New York to pick up their gold. It was 1971, and President Nixon was having none of it. So in one fell swoop, he declared a suspension of anyone's ability to convert dollars into gold. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility. It's always the speculators fault. I find that to be funny. Maybe the speculators tend to target a weak currency because they're running a suboptimal monetary policy and the flows are going to happen in that anyway. Um, there's some rare exceptions where speculative flows may have been able to successfully break a currency like George Soros and the pound was kind of like the, his short was kind of the tipping point that was breaking an already unsustainable system. But generally, if something is in a fashion in a way that cannot last or that is not sustainable with economic reality or implied trade flows, it's going to break whether there are speculators in the marketplace or not. ...of the dollar, in the gold, or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. This short statement would become one of the most pivotal moments in history that hardly anyone knows the importance of. For the first time in modern history, the He is right. The, the removal of the gold window um, is not maybe as important as a lot of gold bugs would highlight to be, 
but it's still one of the most underrated moments in world history and economic history, bar none. Like, if you look at the history of the world, there has not really been a successful run of fiat money for an extended period of time. The fact that we've gone now 50 years of a generally a fiat money system is amazing to me because previous eras of history where countries have gone to full paper money or not backed by a hard metal or asset, they usually end in hyperinflation far quicker than 50 years. So yeah, this was kind of the dawn of the fiat era, which has major implications. The world's money was no longer tied to anything. For the first time, if you want to take people's wealth, if you want them to work for you as your indentured slaves, no longer did you have to do it at the point of a gun or through taxes, both of which breeds resentment. Now all you had to do was print more money. The more money you printed, the more of their wealth you stole from them without them ever even noticing it before. Yeah, it's the inflation tax. Uh, when a government spends, it has to be paid for somehow, and there's three ways you can do it. You can pay for it for bonds, which is borrowing to pay it back in the future with an interest attached to it. You can pay it through tax revenue, or you can pay it through seniorage. And usually, if you're a country with a reserve currency status, the third option is what you choose. Or if you want to run the size of the social welfare state and military industrial complex you have in a country such as the United States, there simply is not enough tax revenue out there to be able to fund the government without choking the economy doing so so this is going to be involved really the question is is that do you want a more fiscally responsible society at the exchange of a short-term decline in economic performance because you have and also a I'd say a much harsher world for the, for the lower classes who are dependent on government services uh, to pay for it, or do you want to paper over problems in the short term and risk a currency crisis in the distant future? Or is too late. Because the dollar amount in their bank account stays the same, but the value of those dollars goes down, the paycheck, even when they make more than $100,000 a year. Most Americans that can save have less than $5,000 in their savings accounts, and the income for the middle and lower classes has stayed nearly the same since 1971, while the upper class continues to climb. The modern pleb is a It's really just a product of assets and who has savings and puts it into stocks or real estate and who doesn't. Uh, the reason why the magnification has really exploded, I think, is one, you can't save just by putting money in the bank and collecting an interest rate greater than inflation. That's what you've been able to do for most of human history, or at least post-World War II history and really as recently as 2008. But now that's not the case and you now have to speculate in assets, whether it's real estate or stocks or commodity futures or whatever it is to keep up with inflation, especially right now when it's the most extreme. You have inflation at 7% as I'm recording this and interest rates at zero. Uh, even though there are signs the Fed's going to hike, they're probably not going to hike as fast um, as inflation has accelerated, that's, hopefully it does calm down. But that's the it's that's the dilemma that has been placed on the market, and a lot of institutional investors have had to respond. And the way they've responded is bid up the prices for a lot of things. Um, a lot of it do also just has to do with um, longevity, which I think is an underrated aspect of this as well. People live a lot longer now than they did in the 70s and the 80s. And if you live a lot longer and you're saving during that whole time period and you're, or somebody already has predisposed savings or have had generational wealth, uh, the amount of time you have to compound increases. And the longer, the later years in life for compounding matter a lot more because those returns compound on a higher base from when you're older. This magnifies equality in two ways. One, it you have more years to compound, obviously, and two, estate taxes are only paid on each generation passing, 
and if each generation lives longer than the last, then the time between estate tax cuts and somebody's wealth gets elongated. So, yeah, is, is the gold standard being gotten rid of a big driver and the primary driver to a lot of inequality? Yes, it is. Are there other variables too, such as longevity, which I think that are underrated in this aspect? Yeah, there is. And the other aspect of this too, which I think I mentioned in the reaction to What If Alt Hist's video, is that globalization and the effect, uh, effects on the labor pool and how it's redistributed wealth from the lower and middle classes of developed countries to the wealthy of emerging markets. And there's a risk you see a similar phenomenon due to work remote technology now for um, more upward, historically upwardly mobile professionals. But we'll see over the next decades what happens on that front. Death slave draped in Louis. And today, we might be witnessing the grand finale of the dollar. Is that I think Jake makes a lot of good points. This is a good primer for people who are not familiar with what happened with the fall of the gold standard and the end of Bretton Woods. But as somebody who's worked in finance for as long as I have and have studied this stuff, it's kind of all just a review to me. But nonetheless, um, yeah, this was a pivotal point in history. It does explain why inflation really started to take off in the 70s and why um, you've had basically asset prices continue to rise faster than incomes but a lot of it also has to do with interest rates going down since the early 80s like the 70s were not a good time like the rich got hurt in the 70s unless they were in the commodities game p multiples contracted in the 70s in terms of stocks and that 1982 was a major structural bear market bottom because of the reaction that the central banks had to do um, in terms of raising interest rates to get the inflation under control and um, housing prices even adjusted for inflation didn't do very well in the 70s either you really didn't see assets start to boom in a real way until the mid 1980s when in inflation got held in check and you saw a steady downtrend in interest rates maybe that's going to change now if we see a higher high in interest rates in the next hiking cycle that has some major structural macro implications. We'll find out later in 2022 um, and beyond if that actually happens, but it is something to watch for. Uh, if you also, just before I end this video, nothing in this video is investment advice. Uh, please do your own research and due diligence uh, before making any investment decisions. If you like the stuff on this channel, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, and if you have anything you'd like me to talk about, feel free to write it in the comments. I do make videos based on what my commenters suggest. And if you like the channel, like and subscribe and support what we're doing. Thank you for watching and good luck out there in the markets.